Before we get started here, Iowa Post Game with Coach Gary Close. want to thank our sponsor, Iowa Smokehouse, and their awesome meat sticks, their steak bites, their barbecue sauces, salsas. Everything's great, and it's great for game day, great for uh, if you had a Super Bowl party here on Sunday or perhaps looking forward to a lot of uh, March Madness watching or NBA playoff watching. And we're approaching the start of college and MLB baseball. Check it out, iowasmokehouse.com, and see how tasting is believing. Use the code Hawkeyes for 15% off your total order. Again, use the code Hawkeyes for 15% off your total order. And especially as a way of thanking Iowa Smokehouse for being a part of this show for the second straight straight year. Excuse me. iowasmokehouse.com and use the code Hawkeyes. Well, folks. I'm going to say something that I don't think I've said before in uh, following a regular season game ever. And uh, I'm sure Coach Close is going to tell me um, I shouldn't have said this. I'm wrong. Yada, yada, yada. It's over. It's over. As it relates to the regular season, it is officially done. Uh, this is this is me stating this, not anyone else. I believe it's over. Iowa can win the rest of the the games on the schedule, which they won't. And they will not make the tournament. Uh, The only way they make the NCAA tournament now is by winning the conference tournament. That's my opinion. Um, And and I think it has legs. They'd be 12-8 and if they went out. But a lot of questionable losses, including a loss on the road to a middling at best Maryland team. I feel like we've said that before. 78-66 this evening. I'm joined by... The one and only Coach Gary Close. <laughs> All right, Gary, am I uh, am I being too dramatic? You tend to be a little bit dramatic, but uh, the the road is a good deal much harder. Yeah, that was that was one they had to have. It's 
it's going to be real difficult now just because of the schedule they got left. They got so many good teams are playing from here on out that. Uh, well, it's not just yeah. because of the schedule, Mark, uh, Gary, because, you know, the best they can be is 12 and 8. And I don't think that's good enough right now with this conference. I, I just don't I think, think, I think 12 and 8 would get him in. I think 12 and 8 would get him in. I don't think they're going to get to 12 and 8, <laughs> but I think 12 and 8 would get him in. All right. Well, hey, listen, if that's the truth. There'll be some teams that'll get in at 12 and 8, maybe less. You think, I'm just curious, if Iowa goes, say they go, say they win the rest of their games, that would make them 12 and 8. They win their yeah. last five, they go 12 and 8, lose first round of the Big Ten tournament. You think they're in? Uh, I think there's a real, they would have beaten Illinois twice, Purdue and Wisconsin. I mean, my good goodness. No, 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 Purdue. They've been, they've. Oh, that's right. They don't have Purdue. They'd have Illinois twice and Wisconsin. Who else Wisconsin's do they have? Wisconsin's in a tailspin right now. Yeah, but they're, they're ranked. They're, they're, you know, they're ranked in the top 20. Yeah. Well, they got no, non, Iowa has no non-conference resume right now. They've gotten swept by Maryland. Horrific loss on the road at Penn State. Oh, and they also lost at home to the worst team, the Big Ten in Michigan. Um, I think they're done. I think they're cooked. I think the only way you could say uh, me say with confidence that they could make the NCAA tournament based on a regular season resume is if they had won tonight and won the rest of their games, finished 13 and seven. Cause I just don't see the wins. Like I, I get what you're saying. Yeah. You get a couple of wins against Illinois. You get that one back home against Wisconsin, but that is at home against Wisconsin. Um, and even even so, like uh, my understanding, I haven't looked at the net rankings here lately. I know our guy Tony is much more infatuated with these rankings than I am, but I'm guessing that those would be the only quad one wins they'd have. I mean, Probably. three quad one wins is going to get you in. I find that hard to believe. Yeah, well, I think twelve and eight might get him, might get him fifth, sixth place. Well, <laughs> I, I, listen. I'll say this, and, and and you've said it before, and I've been a little bit hesitant to go this far. And by the way, folks, I did put the link in the chat if you want to call in and ask Coach a question. But I've made the comment, or you've made the comment in the past, you don't think this conference is is very strong throughout. It's it's down. And I was a little hesitant to say that. In fact, I had been on the record saying I thought this conference would still find a way to get seven, eight, maybe even nine teams in. The more I watch these games, and you watch more Big Ten basketball than I do. I mean, just on a night in and night out basis, I think you watch more than I do. But watching these teams play Iowa, like there's very few teams that have impressed me. I mean, Maryland, Iowa's played Maryland twice, Gary, and Maryland has not impressed me either time. Me neither. And, and let me tell you something else. That first half, the I thought I thought Iowa played terribly in the first half. I thought Maryland played terribly in the first half. I thought Maryland played horribly for three quarters of this game. And I think that's what should be so frustrating. It's what's so frustrating for me. It's not the fact that Iowa lost on the road. I mean, road road wins are traditionally hard to get in this conference. It's the fact that Maryland didn't play well <laughs> at all, like three quarters yeah. of the game. And I thought they played pretty well in the second half. They, they, one of the problems was Iowa could have had, should have had probably a 15-point lead at halftime if they'd have you know done some things a little bit different. Um, but they didn't, and so it was it was a – it was a competitive game at half, and then, you know, they hit a they hit a real lull, and and it was over. So, yeah, it was a, it was a, it was a tough loss. That's another we've said it a few times. That was another very winnable game that um, slipped out of their hands. Iowa play the league. The league is really down. I, I don't. I, I don't. You know, I'm not gonna. I think it's as down as it's been in a long time. Yeah. Uh, I mean, when you have. Michigan and Ohio State at 13th and 14th, those teams are traditionally, you know, top 20 teams. You have Indiana just barely above them. Uh, it's, you know, Michigan State's barely above 500 in the league. Uh, it, it's it's a down league. There's, there's no doubt about it. I, I think we'll, I think they'll, I think they're going to get six. I think, I think they get any more than six is going to be, will surprise me. I know there's a storm out in the East Coast right now. I guess I didn't pay attention whether or not it was affecting life in College Park, but I've never seen in the Xfinity Center that empty. No, I haven't either. Nobody there. There's nobody There's at the no game. Way. There's nobody. There. <laughs> it's incredible. I've seen it a lot in Big Ten games. It's really, uh, yeah. I think the league has got to be somewhat alarmed by it. I, I've seen it in almost every arena, with the exception of maybe Purdue, Michigan State, Indiana, maybe. Um, other than that, Nebraska, you know, maybe I haven't seen all their games, but the games I've seen, 
they played really good teams and had good crowds. But other than that, the crowds are down throughout the entire league, not just a few schools. It's it's alarming. And I, I think it's indicative of the quality of play. I think the quality of play is not as strong as it normally is. This is a great basketball league, and it's just it's just not there this year. 100% agree, and let me piggyback on that. I would not be shocked if this is the year the Big Ten is a little bit more successful in March. I know that sounds like the opposite of what we would normally say, but I think perhaps if the, if there's any validity to the claim that the, the conference is sort of beaten up on itself throughout the regular season, perhaps we see a Wisconsin or a Purdue or maybe even a Northwestern make a run in March. Is that possible? It could. It, it could. I, I, you know, I, as I look around the other conferences, I don't see them as much. I don't see a lot of teams out there that scare scare you. Uh, that, that even even Purdue. I mean, I, I think Purdue's clearly the best team in, in our league and could go a long way. Uh, but you know, if their guards don't shoot well, uh, they could be in trouble. Um, and and I can you know literally in every league, I just I don't see any teams that go whoa. I don't want to play them. Um, I haven't seen UConn a lot. Uh, they might be one. Um, but other than that, I don't, I, I, you know, Kansas gets beat by 30 or 25 to some team. I mean, that's just unheard of. So I, I, I think you're right. I think anybody could get hot and, and go a long way in the tournament because it's, there's really no clear dominant team out there. I, w- I want to make something clear. I'm going to repeat this back because I have a lot of belief in, Coach McCaffrey rallying his guys. I've, I've very rarely, if ever, seen an Iowa team quit late in the year, and I, so I don't think this team's going to quit. I just don't think that's, I just don't think that's the culture of this program. Yeah, I'd agree with that. But I want to ask you this. I'm going to clarify. Are you saying that you believe that if if they go 12 and eight, would you say today that if they go 12 and eight, they're in? I think they have a great shot of getting in at 12 and 8 because I think they're going to fit. If they go 12 and 8, I think they're going to finish fifth or sixth. Here's the thing I don't think 12 and 8 is as crazy as it sounds. I really don't because I don't think like two of those really difficult games you're talking about are at home. Not that they have much of a home atmosphere, but but there's that's still an advantage. You're going to get those games at home. Um, you know, this this was a big, big game tonight you know, to lose, obviously you lost Minnesota on Sunday. It was, it was, it was over and they didn't play well against Minnesota and had to overcome a 20 point deficit. I just think it's almost uh, ironic and, and uh, in a, in a really morbid way, kind of fitting that Iowa, I think stuck a fork in itself by losing a double digit lead just days after overcoming a 20 point deficit at home when they lose a double digit lead on the road. And they lost this game very in a very similar fashion to how they lost this game to Maryland the first time around in Carver. Uh, Jameer Young did not go off like he did in Carver, but it just, it felt like I even texted our guy, Kyle. And I said at 60, 60, I said, it's over. I just, I mean, maybe that's just negative thinking. I hope the players weren't thinking that, but didn't you kind of feel it 60, 60 that the game was over? I thought the big possession was, um, with about 10 minutes to go, they had about an eight point lead and they fouled. They had, they had a possession where they fouled three times and got them to like 16 fouls. And I'm going, uh Oh, now every time they foul, it's going to be a free throw. And, and it, you know, they were up, I think they're up, I think they're up like 58 to 50 at that time. So you can figure it out. You know, they get, I got, I got I'll score 28 to eight. And, um, uh, and then I think Maryland made a point once they saw that, okay, we're driving. We're just going to drive it, drive it, drive it, and drive it and draw fouls. And I don't know what the free throw numbers ended up being, but I'm going to guess the margin of victory probably was at the free throw line in terms of the amount they made and the amount Iowa made. So um, I thought that was a big possession. And then I thought they just, they struggled against their zone. They could not, they couldn't get good shots. Um, and they were out of position, so they had very little chance for offensive rebounds. Allowed them to, to you know, run a little bit, and and um, you know they scored. I don't know what they scored in the second half. They probably scored close to fifty points in the second half after only scoring twenty nine in the first. So um, I thought that was a big possession. I think their ability not to be able to figure out that zone hurt. I'll make a couple of uh, comments here, and I'll quantify what I'm saying here because. First of all, I want to make very clear, you and I have had this discussion about Owen Freeman before. 
uh, Iowa fouls too much, especially uh, I think in, in on the interior. And Owens Young, he's learning. I thought he did a better job at times. He certainly did a better job tonight against Reese than he did the first time around. But mm-hmm. he committed a, another really dumb foul in that first half, 22 feet from the basket at the top of the arc trying to go for a steal. I and mean, you can't afford that. No. I mean, ridiculous early foul. But I did think the officiating down the stretch was subpar, Gary. Would you agree with that? I know you're normally pretty forgiving to the officials. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't. Other than a technical foul, I had nothing really jumped out of me. I, I thought we shot a lot of jump shots and very few shots around the basket that were strong. And whereas Maryland took the ball to a hoop. And usually when that happens, the team that takes it to the hoop is going to shoot more free throws. That's just the way it is. And I think for the most part, that was the case with, with maybe a, a few exceptions. I'll put it this way. I don't think the officials cost them a game. No, I don't um, either. Uh, but, um, you know, it just, uh, you know, they, you, when you get teams in the penalty early and then then they make a dumb foul and you're shooting free throws instead of taking a ball out, it's huge. I mean, it's it's a it's a big, big, big difference. A um, couple notes here. First of all, this was in the first half. And this is, I, I thought, bad officiating. Um, and Iowa played a part in this, but uh, I'd never seen this where you have a Maryland player lose his shoe in the first half, and Iowa's got the ball in the half court. The officials stop the play. Fran's obviously upset about it. Again, the Maryland player was the one that lost his shoe. Play gets stopped to Iowa with the ball, forcing Iowa to inbound the ball from the baseline where they subsequently turn it over on the inbounds pass and then give up a shot. Yeah. Stupidest sequence I've ever seen. Partly Iowa's fault for a dumb turnover and a dumb pass. Partly the official's fault because why would you stop that in that situation and then force Iowa to inbound it from the baseline? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure about that either. That was that was, that was was interesting. Yeah, I, I've, not, I've never seen that before. I don't know what the rule is. We'll have to have somebody find that out. Uh, but I was surprised by that myself. And let me make something clear. If the rule allows what they did, then the rule is stupid, in my opinion. Uh, let's go to our Iowa Smokehouse call online. We've got <laughs> Doug on hold. Doug, welcome. Well, first of all, I am uh, way too happy to let this um, – we had a medical emergency on Monday and um, everything kind of worked out. So um, I think the people that were uh, praying for my mom and stuff, um, she, and uh, I'm very glad that we do live here in Story County. And I want to thank the Mary Greeley Medical Center for all they did for my mom. So, nice. Yeah. Um, but with that being said, because um, yeah, a lot of frustrations. Uh, first of all, so you don't think any team that's 10 and 10 from the Big Ten deserves to go to the NCAA tournament? Um, I'm not well, sure because Nebraska I mean, is seven seven right now, and what already has them as the last four in. I think it's where they finish off. I, I think they'll get six, and if you're yeah. ten to ten and you're six, I think you'll probably get in. I, um, there's no, also a non conference resume to look at, and to, and Doug, I'm just Nebraska's making, worse than ours. I'm making well, I don't know. I, I get, I've not looked like, at Nebraska's resume. I have a hard time believing that a 500 Nebraska team is going to get in without a non conference resume. I find you that look at ours is better than what Lenardi says. We'll find out. Yeah. Um, but well, right now he has six uh Mountain West teams in, and so it, it's uh, I just don't think the bubble is that strong. I would if, if we won the next five games, we're 12 and eight, I would 100%. Believe Iowa would be in the NCAA tournament. Okay, all right, yeah. but they're not the one <laughs> next five games. So we'll it find that out. Yeah. Well, I I don't think it's I don't think it's that far out of the question because Doug, they oh. haven't been that far off. Gary just made a face when I said that, mm-hmm. but they have not been that far off in almost all of their losses, with the exception being a couple early ones, specifically the game against Purdue in conference play. And I mean, they've blown a lot of games. Like that Michigan game blew that game. That's another example. Michigan played horrible basketball in the first half and Iowa just couldn't pull away this game Maryland played horrible in the first half mm-hmm. Iowa didn't make them pay game at home in Carver Maryland did not play well at all Iowa could not pull away let them back in like there's three games right there imagine if they just had those three games back against Maryland Maryland and Michigan two of those are at home mm-hmm. one one more point that I Indiana, at Indiana too that game was very one yes 
I well again close, but the Big Ten's not that good. But also, uh, Northwestern will probably have eleven or twelve wins in the Big Ten. No one has a worse loss than Chicago State in, in the conference period. No team has a worse loss than Chicago State. And they beat Purdue. They're in. Yeah, they're in. Well, they're exactly. in they're they're last. <laughs> I think that yeah. makes now they lost the the other guard, which and they got a tough oh, yeah. schedule. They're they're they got some work to do because not having that guard is going to hurt them. Yeah. Um, again, I, I, midway through the Minnesota game, I had some rants about Fran. Most of what you guys are saying in the chat is accurate about some of the, you know, I did not like some of the lineups. I didn't like some of the zones. Um, I didn't understand several things. Um, what the shoe thing reminded me of, do you remember Aaron White chucking the shoe at Fran? You know what I'm talking about? I don't remember that. I think it was against Northwestern. Somebody in the chat won't remember that. They, the, the same situation, the, the shoot falls off. This had to be like obviously 10, 12 years ago now. Shoot falls off, and Aaron White sees it on the court and chucks it at Fran, and he ducks oh, out of the way. I think I remember that. But, okay. but that's an example. Would you rather people throwing stuff toward the, the sideline, toward the crowd potentially, to get it off the court to avoid what happened yeah. today? Or would you rather the team that lost the shoe and had the, well, the uniform malfunction? Yeah, I didn't know what the rule was, but that was the first thing I was thinking is they can't stop the game. They didn't stop the game that time. So I've seen it before, and they didn't stop the game before. And, yeah. Well, that was also like 10, 15 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> that was a long well, time. I, I Again, um, it, like I said, they played well for a period of time, and uh, that was very similar to the last game. Um, yeah, I don't know what the future with Fran is. And a lot of people call, are calling for stuff. He's been here for 14 years. Um, you know, um, I think there's some things that are misconceptions about, about Fran that are not hundred percent true. I don't okay. think he, I don't think he's a poor, bad. Well, one of the things that was said in the chat uh, was but all our, we, he recruits the exact same player. Um, I'm like, well, there's a lot of diversity in our, our roster. A lot. Yeah, I think, I think, yeah, I think maybe trying to understand where the other side's coming from that, Doug, you, you can, I, I agree with you. There's diversity there, but I think what fans that say that are trying to say is they don't recruit physically gifted players more often than not. They tend, they tend to recruit finesse type. Uh, Long white like guys soft that, that can shoot. Yeah. On athletic white guys that can shoot and, but they don't, aren't taught defense. They're not like very mm-hmm. close old teams at Wisconsin that were, unathletic white guys that could actually defend because they were taught well. Sorry, Gary. Uh, but that's that's how I would – I've described it that way before. And then you have a few exceptions in there, like a Tyler Cook or a, a Tony Perkins, but that's not enough to overcome the core. And I, no, I, offense, no offense to who they have coming in, mm-hmm. but Cooper Cobb – He's never one of them. <laughs> that's just very, he's just very similar. So he fits into the, the Fran mold, but I'm just saying that ain't going to change. Oh, well, that was a lot of what – Tom Davis had a lot of those type of players too. Ryan Bowen, you you know, like there's players like uh, Jess Settles is a, I mean, he was only six seven. You know, there was a lot, um, we had we had a lot of guys. Jr. was one of those type of guys that they would would have had, and well, a lot of those same comments were made about Coach Davis about he, we need to recruit a different breed of player, and um, you know, we were talking about uh, recruiting base, and, and when we were talking about. Because uh, Jordan Bohannon, this was where I was going to go off one of my rants. Jordan Bohan said our, that this is one of the harder jobs in the Big Ten. I, I would disagree for this. You have Chicago. You have Milwaukee. Yes, the other Big Ten schools go there, but there's plenty of talent in Chicago. Lute Olsen got Kenny Arnold and Ryan Lester from there. Um, you know, you guys got a lot of guys. There's enough talent in the state. <laughs> I think that's the core players that you were talking about that they don't want, but I think I think we there. This team is not talentless. They're just missing a couple athletic players. <laughs> um, a shutdown defensive guard. Would but be they've good. always been missing that. Yeah. They've always been missing that, Doug. That's the problem, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And and they have a guy. I think they have a guy in Tony Perkins who fits the part, but he's not because I guess. Coaching would be the only thing I can go fall back on. Like, I believe that if Tony, per- this is, I'm not going to bring up Gary. I'm going to bring up Bo mm-hmm. Ryan. I believe that if Tony Perkins mm-hmm. played under Bo Ryan, Tony Perkins would have been an elite defender. Now I could be wrong, but uh, you know, 
about that. Who knows? Mm-hmm. The development may have been totally different. Maybe he wouldn't be the offensive player he is now. I don't know. But Gary, doesn't Tony Perkins have a lot of tools that that could make him an elite guard? If yeah, that was- I, I agree totally. I think he's. I, mean, I think you talk about an a- athlete. He's an athlete. He is. Yeah. Um, they're going to have the Big Ten freshman of the year. Yeah, yeah they are. Have the Big Ten freshman of the year. That kid's a good player. Um, obviously, the Murray the Murray boys were phenomenal players. They're both playing in the NBA right now. Mm-hmm. I know it's a mile, but so Luke what? Garza. I mean, yeah, uh, Luca Garza is a good example. Um, so I, I think I think that's a little harsh in terms of recruiting. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think these games have all been winnable. So that's what drives yeah. you crazy. If 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 they'd have won these games, yeah. we wouldn't even be having this conversation. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, again, I, I don't know where our future looks. I don't know how we might want to talk about some of this stuff. And you talked about some of it on, um, during this last summer when Jack said he wasn't going to come to Iowa, you know, just what our future is. Fran obviously won't, France, I, I looked this up, France contract does run through 2028. I don't think he's going to stay through all of that. I don't know. Um, but again, uh, we, we we still have five regular season games. Uh, we'll see what happens. I'm going to the game on uh, – at least I believe we're going to the game on Saturday. A lot's happened over this last week. Um, at least I'm – Iowa having an NIT year isn't the end of the world, but Iowa having a multiple losing years, uh, I, I don't think I could take that. <laughs> so right. uh, they need to they need to figure out some things. I, one of the reasons why I want to make the NIT is because it, it might give them – a a chance to stab a few more games to for the guys to improve and uh you know more games maybe means better better turnaround next year but yeah well and more opportunities to yeah. Phil Carver. <laughs> yeah <laughs> well Wisconsin you know Wisconsin played in the NIT last year and got all the way to the finals and they um, claim that was a big part of their ability to get off to a fast start this year. So um, but that's still that's still down the road, and you still got a chance to win the tournament. I mean, that's that's not going to be easy, obviously. But uh, they got they got to play better. I mean, that's that's the bottom line. They've got to they've got to play better um, for the entire you know for a longer period of time. They play in stretches, but just haven't played enough good um, minutes to win games. One last point. One last uh, question or question slash point. Uh, point I want to make right now is. Right now, I think we are playing on Wednesday. I think if you all tiebreakers, uh, they, they they might be 11th right now. So uh, well, that's never happened. <laughs> that doesn't make me feel good. <laughs> Here, here's what I'll say. I, I open this show by saying I, I think they're done as it relates to the regular season. You both disagree with that comment, and great. Well, 12 and 8, if, if, if it gets you in, great. Uh, I don't think we're going to have that discussion because I don't think yeah. we're on 12 and 8, right? Um, I hope I'm wrong on that note. What I was going to say at the the outset, um, assuming they are done, assuming that twelve and eight wouldn't get you in, and that this was a must win, and and the regular season is you cannot, they are not able to play their way into the the, uh, the NCAA tournament by means of the regular season. What I was going to say is, hey, now start focusing on positioning for the conference tournament because that is the great thing about the conference tournament is you still have a shot to make the NCAA tournament. Even if your whole season from November to early March is horrid, you can win four games in four days, and all of a sudden you're playing and you're dancing. My dad, as I told you, every after every loss goes, well, if we win every game from here on out, we're national champs. <laughs> like, okay, yep. <laughs> um, yeah, my exactly. second question point is attendance seems low everywhere. You, you think, um, Coach, that has something to do with people that are not – I mean, not that we've gotten different traditions since COVID and the pandemic – or do you think – I think with Iowa it has a little bit to do with we only have so much disposable income and uh, the women are doing really well and people would prefer to watch a winner. Uh, but why do you think attendance is down? That's a really good question. Uh, um, I, I think it's been consistently going down, um, you know, for a lot of reasons, you know, that we've talked about with people just w- want to stay home and watch it on television. Uh, but I also think there's something to the fact that a lot of these teams are very – have mediocre records and they, um, they just fans want to watch winner. I think the other thing is yep. the student, the student situation and a lot of these schools is really bad. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, when you don't have students getting in the gym. It's, it's obviously your, your attendance hurts the atmosphere. 
I don't yeah. know if there was a student in the place tonight. Yeah, I, <laughs> literally. I don't know if I saw a student section. Yeah, uh, I don't understand. Well, Maryland used to be a hard place to play. I, I've been there. I mean, oh, there, there were about fifty students chanting "air ball." On yeah, I will miss okay. about it. Uh, so I, I don't know if it's one point. I think it's it's a number of things, but I, I do think the league is has got a lot of mediocre teams, and I guess mediocre teams don't draw big crowds. I agree with the the comment on there. He needs to call timeouts better. Um, that's just straight up. It gets ridiculous sometimes that Fran will not call a timeout when we desperately need a timeout. Yeah. You agree with that, Gary? Does does Fran need to become a little bit more liberal with those timeouts? We possibly, possibly. I know, especially on the road, you really want to you really want to have timeouts in your pocket uh, going coming down a stretch. But you know, if you're not in the game down a stretch, then they don't even they don't matter. But yeah, it's it's a it's a it's a kind of a fine line there. When Fran has, on very rare occasions, violated his own two foul rule and let somebody, I think it was probably, I'm thinking back to Luca Garza era, maybe where he let that slide a time or two. I think he's brought that up in the post game press conference that if you're not in the game late, it doesn't really matter. So we were playing to stay in the game. I'd say the same thing to Fran now is, you know, hey, uh, what to your point, to what Doug said, there are times where your, your refusal to call timeouts, so you have timeouts late, is playing you out of games. And there's times where this young team, and it is a young team in a lot of respects, needs the coach to intervene. And um, I just felt like, and I, I know we've we've discussed turnovers in the past and how Iowa really takes care of the ball exceptionally well for how fast they want to play. Just felt like, I mean, there was a turnover by DeSante Bowen. Was that in the first half where you're trying to get the ball past the midcourt line and he just throws it right to, it was a big guy. Yeah. And the, yeah. the transfer for Maryland, and the guy blows the layup, and they get a putback. How many? And we, and we never saw him again. Never saw Desante Bowen again. You're no, right. No. no. Um, I, I just his decision you know, making is really, really questionable. He just uh, he doesn't see the court. He, you know, it's a lot easier to see the court when you're watching on television than you are when you're on the court. But boy, he gets himself into trouble and can't get out of it a lot, uh, which he's going to have to figure out because you can't play him if he doesn't. It feels to me, and I understand this is the name of the game, right, Gary? Playing clean, not making mistakes, and usually the teams that make the least amount of mistakes are the teams that are going to win. But it seems like even though Iowa's turnover numbers aren't exceptionally high, they are they're becoming higher than they are typically for for Iowa teams, for Frank coach teams. Um, and there just seems to be more mistakes. Like it just like in this game, I've talked about Maryland not playing well, and maybe we don't hone in on the mistakes so much because they were ahead at halftime. But that's why I keep saying I thought Maryland played badly in that first half. And Iowa was only up six. Could have only been up by four if it wasn't for a, a last-second um, layup by Patrick McCaffrey with a couple with a second on the clock. Mm -hmm. uh, first half, there was a, a, a – talking about mistakes, one of the worst fouls I've seen Peyton Sanford commit all year where he's behind a play and he tries to reach for the shoulder of Julian Reese on a dunk, an uncontested dunk, and he gets hit with an and one. I mean, careless, just dumb. You can't have those types of mistakes. No. Um, Iowa in the second half, I, I had this noted, Gary, and I understand they're coming out in the matchup zone, which more often than not, to me, doesn't seem to work very well. Brock Harding comes out of a timeout where I was up 10. They come out of a timeout, and Brock Harding is guarding Jameer Young. And what does Jameer Young do? He gets him, in, he gets him isolated and takes him to the rack for an and one. Mm -hmm. How do you come out of a, a timeout with that matchup that you know Jameer Young is going to want to exploit? Yeah. Yeah, it, that's why it's hard to play him. He's he's really a liability defensively because he's small and th doesn't know how to play down there yet. It's um, – yeah, they saw that right away and took advantage of it. He made some good plays other than that, but that was not a good one. But why, from a coaching perspective, would you allow him to be in that position out of a timeout? Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I don't know if they got switched up or he had him on there. That's yeah. I would not have put him on Young. No, I, I wouldn't have done that. But I don't know if it was just a direct play or they ran something where they switched or what happened. But um, you know, that's 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 not a good matchup. Iowa Smokehouse call in line is open, folks. Five one five six three five sixteen zero one. Do want to thank thank RTI Threads. Cooper DeGene's apparel line still up and active as he gets prepped for the NFL draft. 
Also, Carson Shire, Aaron Graves, Aiden Hall, Zach Lutmer all set to return. They'll start spring ball here in about a month. Check out the full NIL apparel of all those athletes and more at rtithreads.com and also learn more about RTI Threads' partnership with Iowa Baseball and the NIL cause there. rtithreads.com and Cooper DeGene's apparel line at cd3lacesup.com. Let's go back to our Iowa Smokehouse column line. We've got Tony on hold. Tony, welcome. Hey, how are you guys doing? Tony, that kid's got to get to bed. It's too late. You know, Gary, she sleeps in to tell at least 9.30 or 10 every morning. Oh. So I'm not – I don't complain. I let her I let her choose her bedtime. She's only about like two and a quarter, two and a half years old. So I just let her choose her bedtime. Okay. May may not be the best parenting decision, but it works with my wife's schedule when she gets up at 3 a.m. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um in the spirit of what? In the spirit Lent, no, no. I'm saying Lent and Ash Wednesday. <laughs> I'm going to give up being always so positive on Fran after this post game here. Because right I've always been positive on him. Um, one thing I want to ask is why is Owen Freeman not getting any love from the whistle? He's the odds on favorite to be Big Ten player of the freshman of the year. And he gets zero love from the referees, it seems like. Yeah, I think that's that's probably a good question. I think part of it's being a freshman and earning your earning your stripes. I think part of it's he's a little he's got to learn how to get a little more um, explosive, a little more stronger moves around the basket where he can draw contact and, and things like that. Um, he's 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 a little I'm not going to say weak, but a little a little passive. Um, to where you where referees like to make calls, um, but he'll get there. Uh, I think he's got a chance to be really good. I agree. It just it sucks going through the growing pains after what we've seen for the past how many years? You know. Yeah. When he gets stronger, he'll he'll uh, he'll he'll be much more effective down there. Uh, and and you see it across the league. You see a lot of the young big guys. That struggled, and a lot of it's just strength. They're just not strong enough yet, and they need another year in the weight room to, you know, you know, get, just get stronger and be able to handle the physical part of the game. Do you feel you see the most um, improvement strength-wise from that freshman to sophomore year versus any other years like sophomore to junior, junior to senior, and stuff like that? Is is that yeah, the biggest? Yeah, it could be. I, I think it's you know, in a lot of cases, it's kind of a steady. A steady growth, but you see a lot from freshman to sophomore just because most of them haven't had a whole lot of weight training, you know, really, really strong, um, consistent weight training that, that they get in college, although that's changing. Uh, but and then, you know, some of it's just maturity and, and growing and things like that. But you know, he I don't know what he weighs now, but he'll probably be 20, 30 pounds heavier in a year or two. And, Trust me, when you're throwing that around, it, it, it's a little more effective. For me, it seems like we have zero calming presence on this team. What I mean by that is you could feel that, you know, a lot of us who've watched basketball a lot, you could just feel the lead slipping away. And there's mm -hmm. no calming presence like, okay, we need to drive the lane and get the bucket. And you said, you said this earlier, like, and I agree with you, that – we don't get into the bonus because we're just settling for jump shots. That's it. Like if you're not driving the lane and forcing the issue, you're not going to get fouls. Right. Just right. plain and simple. And that's why, you know, teams play zone is they're hoping that you'll get jump shot happy. And, you know, and if that's the case, then, then your chances of getting fouled go down. And I, I don't know how many free throws Iowa shot in the second half, but it wasn't many. It wasn't many for the game, but I, I, in the second half, I, I, I was very few. Um, and 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 Maryland paraded to the free throw line. Yeah. And then uh, one last thing I'll just close on to show I've changed my colors or however you want to say this, Corey. I will criticize the referees. That might have been the weakest technical I've ever seen. I agree with that. Seconds. Like he's looking at the crowd. He wasn't even looking at the referee. He was looking at the crowd. 
like the referee just had I was just gonna call it to you right here. Did he was, did he say something to the crowd? He, he you could see his mouth moving a little bit, but nothing that's what I think is ridiculous about that. And I thought Stephen Bardo described it perfectly. Like, you know the things that are being said. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and those players can hear that when you have a bare arena. Okay. Mm-hmm. So like at, at some point, like if the, obviously we don't want a malice in the palace situation, we don't yeah. Tony Perkins running into yeah. the stands, but that's not what he did. And but he was nowhere close to doing that. Yeah. Sorry. No, 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 no. That's what I'm saying. Like, you know, I completely agree with you. Stupid, stupid call. That's, that's to me, that's an instance where I'm looking at an official saying, you know, you were more concerned in that moment with making yourself known. Yes. And you were making the, the smart and reasonable call. Yes. Like everything, game, game situation, time situation. There was zero reason to call that. Zero reason. Yeah, I agree. In my opinion. And then if anything, you should walk over and say, hey, don't, don't, don't yeah. be doing that. It doesn't look good on TV and leave it at that. Yeah, that's bad. That's all I got. And we'll see you guys on uh, Saturday afternoon. <laughs> I mean, that's all. I mean, you I, know what? I, I'll tell you what. I tell you what that is. That was Tony. You Did you hear? I want everybody to, to stop and rewind this back ahead. to the show. The way Tony said that, like, did you hear the inflection at the end of his voice, Gary? <laughs> that was the inflection of somebody who is genuinely concerned that he's not going to see us again this season because I declared it done. <laughs> <laughs> he's like very Can hopeful. Call the show off. <laughs> no, we're not calling the show off, Tony. I, hey, again, I don't think it's out of the question to say they could finish twelve and eight. And if Gary thinks that that gives them a shot in, so be it. They don't look like a tournament team right now. The, the, no, they they look like an they, NIT team, and I agree. I agree. Know, I, agree. I don't even know if they look like an NIT team. They, right? I don't even know that they look like an NIT team. And I mean that seriously. I'm an Iowa guy, Tony. I'm not just ripping. I don't know that they look like an NIT team because I think there's a lot of bad. I think there's a lot of bad teams making Iowa look a little bit better than they are. When you read between the lines of some of the mistakes they're making, I, I don't know. I, I could be totally. I, I guess. I guess it's for me. You you overcome know, a twenty you, point lead at home to Minnesota. I, I understand and I get it, but for me, it's more of the I'm looking at how the NIT is going to be selected this year, and it's going to take a monumental collapse from Iowa like like even if they perform to metrics and only win maybe one or two more games they're going to be a lock for the NIT it just it's just the way it's just the way the NIT selected this year what's their I, overall record 14 Iowa? yeah 14. but they, they don't they don't do that a uh, coach close anymore it's by the net rankings and you just have to be top two of the non-selected Big Ten teams who don't make the NCAA oh, okay. tournament. That's you learn it. something every day. Yeah, it, it, it's dumb. I'm sorry, it's dumb because the mid majors should rule. I never got involved with the NIT. I was always yeah. preparing for the NCAA. So <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> and and, be, and beating my you know crushing, straight years in a row. And, and I'll close out crushing my high school dreams by preparing to go to Vets Auditorium. Yes, I forgot know, about that. Yeah, Regina. I'm glad you brought that up. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. I appreciate everything. Right, I see you, Tony. Appreciate it. All right. A couple things here. I got a couple callers to finish this thing off. But uh, first of all, a couple questions in the chat I want to address. Jet Pilot says, Why has Pat McCaffrey never learned to not pick up his dribble without knowing who he's going to pass to? Does that seem to be an issue uh, picking up the dribble? I don't think he's the only one. Uh, they, I, I have said, I've thought they've dribbled more this year than they've ever dribbled before. Uh, and, and, and more dribbling that's, that's not doing anything. Right. You know, it's, it's more East and West and not North and South where you're breaking defenses down. And, um, you know, when you drive baseline, you better have some kind of a retreat dribble to get out of there. If there's nothing there, you're going to turn the ball over. I only got one when a Maryland guy went baseline and they double teamed and he threw the thing away or maybe that I can't remember. But anyway, yeah, no, I, I think, um, yeah, you got an, you the guy's right. You got to know where you're going with it before you pick the pick the dribble up. Again, I look at the the uh, stat sheet: eleven Maryland turnovers, nine for Iowa. And you think nine on the road's not bad? To me, just though the quality or the lack thereof of those turnovers is what is astounding to me. There are more bad turnovers, it appears to me, than 
in a typical yeah, a lot game. of them resulted in, in instant baskets at the other yeah. end. That's those are the ones that really kill you. You know, if you're gonna turn it over and on a pass, throw it into the you know, upper deck. Don't throw it to the other team. Um, because now they go down and score and it's it's a double uh double whammy. So and they had a few of those that really that really hurt. Uh, Rick Maeve says the boy. Who's the boy? The boy said during the gopher game that he thought Brock might hit the portal. Got me thinking, how about you and coach Corey? Who is the boy? Am I missing something here? Uh, I don't know who said I don't know who said that Brock would hit the portal. I don't know why Brock would hit the portal. He's Quad City's kid. He's playing with Owen Freeman, who's I I assume is one of his best friends. So I, I don't know if that was tongue in cheek. Well, Freeman leaves, so they gotta have some they gotta have some guards. I, yeah, I don't I don't see that either, but that portal is crazy. I mean, it is nothing would surprise me when it comes to the portal. Well, Brock didn't have really any other power five offers out of high school, and I don't know that he's done enough. As a freshman, yeah, I, agree. I agree with that. I don't think they'll be knocking down his door. No, no I agree. Um, Ari Gold. Now, now, Owen Freeman, if he wanted to jump to the portal, there'll be people knocking down his door. A lot of people. <laughs> he could probably name his school. Ari Gold, Corey, when should Fran get the proverbial boot? We can talk about that after the season. He's not getting no boot for – they could lose the rest of their games. He's not going to get the boot. I know people don't like that when I say it, but he's just not. And I don't think he should. So I've been ripped for before for defending him. I'm not defending him. I'm just saying, grand scheme of things, he's not going to get fired for one losing season. They've been to the tournament basically every year since, what, 2017? Well, they mentioned it on the telecast today. There are only one of four teams that have been there four years in a row. That's, isn't that amazing? Uh, and three of them are in the Big Ten. Now, I know the Big Ten gets a lot of teams in, but um, – only four teams, three of which are in the Big Ten, have been to the NCAA tournament four years in a row, um, and Iowa's one of them. Jason in the chat says, hello, uh, is it me or does Fran, a Fran coach team not value the basketball? Well, again, they had nine turnovers, but I do think, I mean, that Jason's kind of, I think, saying what I said here a minute ago. It just feels like they value the ball less because – of the, of They've the, had more uglier turnovers this year. I, I would yeah, agree with that. They're really, I mean, they, you shake your head at some of the ones they yes that they do that are just dumb and really, and then cost the team badly because they end up being baskets at the other end. I think they've had more of those this year for sure. And they've had more turnovers. I mean, they traditionally been really good uh, taking care of the ball. When, when, you know, as we mentioned, a team that plays as fast as they do, it's it's pretty remarkable. Let's go back to our Iowa Smokehouse call in line. We've got Kyle on the line. Kyle, welcome. Good evening, guys. Kyle, how'd you get in the middle? Let's move you over there. We go. <laughs> now we got you to the right spot. You, want, uh, you don't like putting me center stage? No, Gary's always center stage. I've promised him that in advance. It's part of I our won't show. come on the show unless I'm there. <laughs> That's part of the contract, right? No, it is. That's part of my big contract. Yep. Well, I got uh, I got a bone to pick with you, Corey. Oh, wonderful. What uh, what do you think their odds are of going uh, twelve and eight in conference play? Because you just said they have a chance to do that. They have a chance. They have a chance. Yes. Right, you're going to give me some ridiculous analytic <laughs> from ESPN that I don't care about. Okay. <laughs> do you want to know what it is? What is it like? One percent? Four percent? It's not even one tenth of one percent. Uh, I don't agree. With that. The, the schedule is not all okay. Let me just break this down. They get Wisconsin at home Saturday. Now, I don't think it's going to be – you think people are going to show up for a Saturday afternoon game at home for against Wisconsin? Gary says yes. I say no, and Kyle says no. I'm telling you he's going to show up as Wisconsin player, people. <laughs> okay. Well, if there's Wisconsin fans at Carver, that's one. I think, there'll be, I think there'll be a good crowd Saturday. Gary, are you going to be there? I am. There you go. You might, you might bring him out then. See, that's why Gary thinks there's going to be a – a good crowd Saturday because he's going to be there. Um, how many, I'd like to see how many, uh, this is, uh, I'm looking at seat geek. I'm trying to find Kyle. You're a, a, you like to do this, find out how many tickets there are available right now. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, I'm looking at the schedule. You got Wisconsin at home. Honestly, Iowa had a shot of beating them there back. Remember that game back in December that Wisconsin. No, not really. I mean, they did, but not really. Wisconsin played badly. They were, the they were tied with what eight or nine minutes or nine minutes to go, 
something like that. Was it? And they okay. lost the last nine minutes by 10 points or 11. Yeah. Wisconsin did not play well. And by the way, Wisconsin's not playing great right now either. I mean, even their win last night, they looked very average. Uh, but um, the things that they do well are the things that Iowa does not. And that that's that concerns me. Obviously, at Michigan State's going to be incredibly difficult, but Michigan State is not. They've got to go to Michigan State and Illinois. Yes. And Northwestern. They're not, they're not going to Illinois. <laughs> no, they're not. <laughs> they, they, Michigan State's finally playing somewhat close to what people thought they were going to play. Like, I, 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 I don't see it. Plus, they got to keep winning. Michigan State's got to keep winning to get in the tournament. No, I don't. And Illinois is really good. Uh, I can see him beating them once, maybe. And there's no way they'll beat them like twice. See, Gary's the perfect guy to have on the show with me because when I talk about the world coming to an end, he says, "No, I don't, I don't think so." But then when I when he finally convinces me, he's like, "No, nah, they're not going twelve and eight. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. But I, and then because of that, I think if they did, they would have a real good shot of of, of, of dancing. Okay, all right, I'm I'm totally fine with that, and and because um, they will have beaten four teams that are going to be in the tournament. And is there something to be said for having What's their fifth game? Illinois. They play Illinois, Illinois twice. Illinois, Wisconsin, Michigan State, and what's the last one? Penn State at home. Oh, Penn State. That's the only it's the only game they're favored in. Yeah. Well, you got to take them one at a time. They got to win Saturday to to get to 12 and 8. <laughs> and that's that's according to Corey to maybe have a chance. Not not to not to secure their chances. I don't think. No, I said they're done. I, I've I've made that comment. I don't think twelve and eight gets you in. But but I, I I've on. I've said I've been consistent on this for the last month. I said they need to get to fourteen total Big Ten wins, either twelve in the regular season plus two more in the tournament, or at least eleven and three tournament wins. That's like they got to win. It, like twelve and eight won't like on its own will not do it. Well, I, I agree with you, Kyle. But but Gary and and our our friend Doug does not agree. They do not agree. So. I don't we'll know see. if we'll have a chance to find that out, but probably not going to have a chance to find that out anyways. But but here's what they will have a chance to do, Gary. That's why I said if you're if you're looking, you know, if the goal is let's make the NCAA tournament, then yeah, you win every game, you got a shot. Uh, but more reasonably, I think it's more reasonable to say you could go to a, a conference tournament and rattle off three or four games, well, four or five games on a neutral court, back to back to back to back. So maybe, you know, if you can position yourself to where you don't have to play Wednesday and at least get some momentum and, you know, an opportunity, you get Illinois, the final game of the regular season, you beat them at home, that'd be a nice way to finish the year For sure. and heading into the Big Ten tournament. So I, I will say, uh, I think Coach Close has probably got us on this one, Corey, because I, I can't get an exact number, but it looks like there's about three or 4,000 tickets left, which means there's already about 11,000 or 10,000 people. Yeah. And how tickets. many of those, how many of those 4,000 tickets are going to get bought between now and Saturday? Kyle. I don't know. I might scoop one if I can. Oh, <laughs> <right>. <laughs> I'll add to it. <laughs> but but hey, if, they, if they had, a, if they, I think it's going to be a decent grow. If think. they had 11,000 people there, I'd be happy. Wouldn't you? They'll get 11. Well, that's 11,000 tickets accounted for. That does not mean 11,000 will be there. But anyways, yes, I would be happy with 11,000 given the situation. Would I, in the grand scheme of things, I think 11,000. 8,000 more than Maryland got tonight. <laughs> that's true. Yeah. That was It was pathetic. That but 11,000 in general, 11,000 at home on a Saturday afternoon in mid-February with good weather is ridiculous. Yeah, I agree. I agree. But they're, you know, they're not, they're not at the top of the league. If they're at the yeah, top again, of the league, it would be 15. They, 15 they, last they, year. they last can't, year was, they those, can't, those complain. games would have been sold out last year. Yeah. They, they can't, they can't complain about it because they're not, I mean, if they're, if they're playing the way they need to be playing and they still don't sell out, then yeah. I, then I understand, I you know, Connor, Patrick goes on Twitter and they complain about it, but not when you're six and eight. I mean, they've lost. They, I mean, they've just given away like four or five games. Like they were, I, I was looking back at some of their own game log, their old game logs. They lost the last minute 45 at Indiana by eight, and they were up two at that point. They lost the last seven minutes at Penn State by 17 points. They were up seven at that point. They lost the last 11 minutes by 19 to night to, to Maryland and did the same thing at home. Like, what 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 do you think the biggest, I mean, because they, they have, the, the middle part of these games have been okay. 
what what happens to teams like what what happens to teams that are in, are constructed in a certain way that they just fall apart down the stretch like this? Is it is it just the defense? Is it? I think it's the with the ball. Yeah, yeah. You're going to get lulls offensively, and that's where you need your defense to yeah keep it close. Um, and like we've mentioned, I think they've had some ugly turnovers that have really uh, really hurt them. And they've 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 had some times where they foul too much, and then teams get in the penalty and. Uh, and then they, they, you know, they score points at the free throw line. So, but so, and that's all related to the defensive end. I think that's, um, I think that's the big thing. Interesting tonight. Um, so with, I think it was about 13 or 13, 13 and a half minutes, 13, 24 to go in the game. Iowa drew their, the fourth team foul on Maryland, 13, 24 to go. And the next time they drew a foul was a Dante Scott foul that was committed with 55 seconds to go. So they didn't draw a single foul for over 12 minutes or about 12 minutes. And in that time frame, Maryland drew 11 fouls <laughs> in between Iowa's drawing one yeah. foul. Well, Maryland was driving it and Iowa was shooting jump sure. shots. And that's, that's, that's what zones can, can do to you. It shouldn't, but. It, it, it does do it at times. You get um, you get a little jump shot happy, and if they're not dropping, those are long rebounds that let let teams run. And they're they're Maryland's fairly athletic. They can they, are. they can they can attack with some with some ability, and they that's what they did. I, th- I think at halftime they said, "Hey, we're attacking. We're taking a ball of the hoop and and make them make them stop us." Yeah. And Jesse in the the chat says, "On a positive note, I thought Iowa played some of the best defense I've seen." For three quarters of the game, I love Jesse. He's here all the time. I couldn't disagree more. I thought Iowa's defense was poor in the first half. I thought Maryland missed a lot of open shots. They were. It was. It was weird because Maryland, like, even even from like the beginning of the first half, and then they like the first twelve minutes or ten minutes. I don't know how long it was. It just felt like Maryland was just. I mean, they were just terrible offensively. That's and then they just then they just flipped the switch and they had six minutes where they scored like. 20 points or something like that. Like give, it, it was weird because they went give, on and off and on and off. I think you give Owen Freeman a credit for being a presence down low, not picking up that second foul at an inopportune time and then letting uh, Julian Reese go off on you. Maryland probably did settle for a few too many jump shots, but a lot of those jump shots, including some of those corner threes, were open. Mm-hmm. And you kept thinking at some point they're going to start making these shots. I mean, it's our three of 12 from the field. I don't think Maryland's a very good three-point shooting team. Well, then that's I think they're one of the worst in the league. And so I I wouldn't be surprised that was part of their defensive plan. And that's why I don't think they shot as many in the second half. And they attacked. And we they weren't able to control contain the ball as much. And that led to free throws, that led to easier shots, led to layups, and that led to nearly 50 points. And if Iowa was better offensively, I understand Maryland digs in and plays defense and they've got the athleticism to, to uh, stay in games on that end. But Iowa had opportunities in that first half as bad as Maryland was offensively. You build a 15 point lead at halftime. It's a different story. Instead it's a six point game. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, that's all for the way the game is game, you're like, you know, the, the, you, there's no reason Iowa shouldn't be up by more than they are now. And eventually it came back to bite them. Yeah. yeah. You think uh, you think there's any chance, and you can tell me what you would do too, Coach Close. But you know, like say they say they go through the next two games and they lose both of those two, and they kind of they kind of go, okay, we're we're out of the tournament except for a miracle run in the Big Ten tournament. Do you see? And I'm not talking about benching people or like cutting people's minutes in half, but do you start seeing people like? I mean, Owen's been getting plenty of run, but people like Dembele and um, Harding and and Bowen getting some more minutes, and maybe you know people like Patrick or Cricky that are done after this year, do you see their minutes start to fade even by maybe three to five minutes a game? Or is that not something you're even, I don't, I, I don't think so. I, I think they're, I think they're going to go full bore until they can't do it anymore. Partly because of what Corey said with the, with the uh, league tournament. I mean, you, you can't coach a team as a hey, look, you know, we still got a chance to, you know, let's let's get let's get playing the best we can. We still got a chance in the tournament. It may, may be long shot, but we still got one. And then and then start not playing people. So, yeah. No, I don't think so. And, and and quite frankly, I don't think any of those guys are playing to the level that they didn't even deserve. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the bench was not good tonight. They, they didn't get much much from the bench. Um, yeah. And so I, I think 
and I don't think I don't think there'll be much much change there. Patrick played a great game, uh, you know, against Minnesota. He didn't he did not play as well tonight. I think the quickness and the length bothered him a little bit, but I yeah. thought maybe he was on his way to getting back to where he was. I was encouraged with how he played last weekend, but that didn't translate today. And they're the, quite frankly, they're a team that has to have everybody contributing something. If they don't, their their margin of error is just too small to to uh, to win and their defense isn't good enough to you know consistently stop people when their offense struggles yeah it's yeah. tough because we're like me and Corey both have been rooting for um <laughs> for DeSante Bowen and then it was just tough to watch him come in the game and then commit one turnover and I mean I it was a terrible turnover but it was just and I'm not I'm not even criticizing the decision to take him out of the game but it was just tough to watch to see him get snatched out the game like that yeah. mistake He's just not doing a lot of positive things. Uh, he, yeah. he doesn't finish well. Uh, you'd think he'd be a better defender because uh, he's got good quickness. But yeah. I, I know they're. I'm sure they're hoping to see something in there to get get him more minutes because he's he's athletic. He's got some talent, but it just hasn't translated on the court. It still could. I don't yeah. know this year, but I mean, there's a lot there, and it's just you know, just it's it's people people mature at different rates, and and it's been a struggle for him. Yeah. RTI Threads player of the game, Peyton Sanford, 19 points. Uh, I had a hard time picking out a player of the game, basically, um, because he shot 7 of 16 after making two early threes, ended up struggling uh, the rest of the way. In fact, he started off 2 of 2 from 3, and do the math, he finished 1 of 7 down the stretch. He had 3 of 3, didn't he? I think he did, too. I think he made his first 3. Okay, yeah. there you go. He was 0 of 6 the rest of the way. <laughs> Five rebounds. Now I'm going to guess of those six, four of them were bad shots. Yes, yes he took he heavily contested off balance. I, he makes a few of those, but man, if he could learn to get a little better in terms of shot selection or shot fake and drive around somebody, because you know they're gonna fly at him. Yeah, he just takes yeah. some really difficult shots that um, got nothing to do with technique. They're just they're twenty percent shots. Yeah, yeah. Kyle, uh, appreciate you calling in, sir. And yeah, Kyle, good to see you. We'll good see, see you again Saturday. Yeah, hopefully. Thank All you, right. sir. All right, let's go to our final Iowa Smokehouse caller of the night. We're going to keep this one quick as we finish up our discussion on Iowa's 78-66 loss against Maryland. We've got Drill MVP on the line. Drill MVP, welcome. Thank you for having me on, Corey. How are you doing, you and Coach Close? Doing, doing great. great. We need to see your picture. Yeah, why can't we see you, Drill? Oh, I don't want to show my face. I'm doing everybody a service by not showing my face. <laughs> All right. Okay, so let's, I want to take a right. more holistic. Uh-oh, yeah, we don't away. want Coach to leave on us, Corey. This is part of his contract, remember? Jeez. I know. I'm a team player. Okay, good, good. Iowa needs a few team players. <laughs> so I want to take a more holistic view of the Iowa season. Kyle did a good job going into the details of this game. But I want to ask you, Iowa was a brand a, a, a younger team. What have you seen that they've improved on since the beginning of the season? Just like two or three things. They've said, this is somebody who's really improved. This is a, a rotation that's really improved. What are some things you've seen? That's a good question. Um, I think Tony, for the most part, has emerged as one of the best guards in the Big Ten. I've got a lot of confidence in him. Tonight was not one of those nights. Uh, the problem is he doesn't have a whole lot of people helping him. So it's, you know, it's kind of all on his shoulders. And when he doesn't play well, it kind of sticks out. Um, I think it's been really encouraging watching Owen uh, Freeman develop into the, the Big Ten freshman of the year. Um, and I think Peyton Sanford has established himself as one of the top top players in the league. Uh, so I, I think those would be my three three positives. I would have agreed with those first two, especially, um, uh, you know, Tony has been for the most part, a revelation. He was three of 13 tonight and struggled from the field, but he had eight rebounds. He, uh, for the most part, takes care of the ball again, not his best night. He had a third of Iowa's turnovers this evening, but, uh, you know, he's their starting point guard. It's, it's not DeSante Bowen. It's not Josh Dix. It's not Brock Harding. It's Tony Perkins. And, uh, there have been times where he's been considered to be an off guard, but I, I want the ball in his hands in crucial moments. There's nobody else that I, I want him defending the best player and I want him with the ball in his hands. Now it doesn't mean he's a great defender right now, 
but he's the best they got. And I think he's the best option they have handling the ball offensively. Um, he's struggling right now from three. He's not made a three in a while. And it'd be nice to get that monkey off his back because we know he can, but he's going to have a hard time. He's going to have a hard time playing in the NBA ever if he can at some point prove that his three point shot is at least semi consistent. And I do think that that's not fool's goal to think or, or a farce to think that he's a potential NBA guy if he can start making shots. And that's probably not going to be this next year. But if he comes back for an extra season, maybe improves that outside shot, he's got the tools. Can he um, come back for another year? He's got one year of eligibility. Yes. Wow. Well, that would be great if he could. And I think he should take it. That's my opinion. I think he ought to take it and, you know, took a, took a nice jump this year, but I, I think he's got the tools to develop. It's not like no offense to Jordan Bohannon. We, we knew Jordan Bohannon wasn't going to him coming back for two extra years or whatever he did. No one thought, Oh, he's going to develop into an NBA guy. Tony Perkins has got some tools in the toolbox that make me think that maybe, maybe he takes an extra year. He can, you know, take another step forward and actually be a prospect, maybe a second round pick someday. That was fantastic. I'm trying to increase the energy because you all have been down all the show. So I want to end it on a high note for you all. But you yeah, I, I want to bring some positivity. So Iowa to me is where I expected to be in terms of results. However, I expected the Big Ten to be slightly better this year than it is. I mean, this is the worst I've seen the Big Ten in a long, long time. Do you think that contributes to just the overall mood of the Iowa fan base being this down? Because if they just beat Michigan and they beat Maryland twice, I think everybody's super pleased with where they're at. No doubt. No doubt. And they, then they'd be right in the hunt. And those are, uh, that's why it's frustrating because those, those, all those games are winnable. Those teams are not that good. Um, I think when they look back on the year, they're going to kick themselves because they, they had opportunities to win all those games, including tonight. And if they had, they'd be right in the mix because we're, you know, we're, we're, we see it that, that uh, other than those, you know, three or four teams at the top, everybody else is just kind of jumbled all together and beating each other up. Michigan State is starting to kind of show that they might be moving in that direction. But up until a week ago, they weren't even in the mix. So it's, um, I, I agree with you. It's, it's, as, it's as mediocre a year I know there's a lot of parity, but in terms of really quality teams that, I, that I've seen in a long time, but you know, it happens. And who, and like Corey said, who knows? Some, some of those teams might really take off the NCAA tournament. It'll, it'll save, save the season, so to speak. If we can get, you know, we can get a team into the final four, win a national championship, then, then everything's great. <laughs> so, cause you're judged on how you do in, in the NCAA winning, winning big 10 titles is one thing, but, you know, getting the final four and winning national titles is a whole different animal. Thank you for the call, Drill MVP. And yeah, to piggyback on that, Zach Eady, I know they have struggled. Purdue has struggled uh, in the tournament of late, but he is, I've still got to believe he's a matchup nightmare, especially for a team on a short prep. Um, so get out of that first round. Um, and if you can make, if you can even make the, I think they're a but tough. You know, if those guards go cold. I think those guards are better. They're a year older. They go cold, and they don't have to be guarded. Then it's like, a, you know, I think Purdue's got a great shot. They're, they're well coached, and they've they've got they, they've got some weapons. I think I think Illinois is in the same category. I think Illinois is very dangerous. I think they got some players. Um, beyond that, I'm not sure. Drew wants to know about uh, substitution patterns. What are your thoughts on? The subbing patterns of Fran McCaffrey this evening. I, you know, I don't think there's a whole lot of subbing going on. I think he's stuck with his top guys for the most part, with a with, with a few with a few exceptions. But um, you know, I, I don't I don't know how much confidence he's got in his bench. He's just not getting consistent positive uh, play out of out of most of them. It's been it's been kind of a crapshoot. The only thing I would say about this and I've commented on this in the past. I don't think there should be a time, if at all possible, where Peyton Sanford and Tony Perkins should be out of a game at the same time. I, I just think when you do that, it creates such an awkward offensive lineup. Um, and he did that this evening, and it was, you know, I don't even know who it was. DeSante Bowen, Price, Dimbelli. It's like, where's the offense coming from? Right. You know? And um, there have even been times where Freeman's off the court at the same time as those 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 two. So 
Uh, anyways, Drill MVP did want me to ask you, uh, Gary, uh, regarding the Ohio State job. I know a lot of people have a lot of uh, respect for Chris Holtman, and uh, we had thought this might have happened by now. That that's just been a weird situation because he seems. I mean, he seems to be well respected across the conference. Yeah. Yeah. He's having won enough games. Just your thoughts on his firing yeah. and the job opening. Yeah, it's um, you know I watched them last night and um, they um, they really struggle. They're, they're just they're not a very good basketball team right now, which is you know we talked about it. it's shocking with you know with all the high school talent in that state. When you're talking Cleveland and Cincinnati and Toledo and Akron and Dayton and I mean there are all kinds of players in their backyard. Uh, you know, he got off to a terrific start and the last couple of years have been a real struggle. I think he only won five games last year and Ohio state just doesn't, you know, it's like same thing, like in football, they did that. They got to be gone. It's just, that's just the way it is there. You got to win. And uh, he'll, he'll, he'll bounce back somewhere else. Cause he's a good coach. It's just, um, uh, they just, you know, they just, they just aren't playing well. I mean, they're really, uh, they're really playing they could have won last night. They, they easily could have won that game at Wisconsin last night. Wisconsin, I think it was more how Ohio State played than Wisconsin did. I, I, I thought they had a legitimate shot to beat them, and they just couldn't get a rebound. They dumb fouls, bad turnovers, can't finish around the basket, and just one thing after another, and and then it kind of mushrooms. And so that'll be a job that a lot of people will be interested in and uh, there's no reason why Ohio State shouldn't be in the top four every year. There's too much going going good there that shouldn't be like that. But it'll probably take a little time. I want to thank our sponsor, RTI Threads, for being with us throughout men's basketball season. Definitely uh, search their NIL and uh, merch lines for their many Iowa athletic partners. RTIThreads.com. They're also working with Iowa baseball, which is starting up here. And I think what less than two weeks, rtithreads.com shop the apparel lines of a number of Hawkeye athletes, including the grave digger, Aaron Graves himself, along with Carson Shire, Zach Lutmer, Aiden Hall, a bunch of small town Iowa kids, and the ultimate small town Iowa kid out of Odebolt, Iowa, Cooper DeGene, his apparel line, his merch line over at cd3lacesup.com. And speaking of RTI Threads, our RTI Threads player of the game this evening. It was Peyton Sanford, 19 points, 7 of 16 from the field, 3 of 9 from 3, 5 boards, 3 assists. But I'm guessing he doesn't feel like the player of the game because uh, he did – if you if what you and Kyle said was correct, he started 3 of 3 from 3 and finished 3 of 9. So uh, that's not going to make him too happy. And they went cold no. in that second half, and they could have used his shot making. But took bad yeah. shots. He took a few bad shots, but I, you, you love his enthusiasm. The, the kid wants to win. I, I'd have him. I'd have him on my team any day of the week. Uh, he's he's a good college basketball player. Yep. He just needs a little more around him. Yep. Uh, I want to thank Iowa Smokehouse as well. One final plug for them before we head out. Tasting is believing. Check out the lineup. Sure to satisfy you and your family's snacking needs at iowasmokehouse.com and use the code Hawkeyes for fifteen percent off your total order get prep for march madness and stay tuned because uh caught wind that maybe a special promo deal coming out tomorrow so be sure to stock up with the code hawkeyes tonight and of course a big day in hawkeye nation tomorrow as caitlin clark is set to break the all-time scoring record for uh, ncaa women's college basketball and that game of course will be tomorrow night at 7 p.m over on peacock so check it out, Peacock. She gets a chance to break the record, and it's going to be on Peacock. <laughs> I knew you'd find a way to complain about it, Gary. I just—I should have known. It's six bucks. It's six bucks. I don't care. <laughs> yeah, Big Ten Plus. You got Peacock. Come on, man. They got a chance. You know, people out in California—they want to see that. Why can't people in California buy Peacock? Because they got to buy everything else. I, I I think it's ridiculous. The big thing is they want to put it on Peacock. I I will tell you this. I'm not going to put a plug in for this coffee shop. I went and got myself a coffee today, and it was over six dollars. Okay, for a medium iced coffee drink, it was over Peacock, six. Peacock six dollars a month. Yes. So, give up your morning coffee for those of you that are. Uh, are you a coffee guy in the morning, Gary? I'll have a cup of coffee, sure. Okay, good. 
So give up that it's cup just of coffee. A, it's just a, it's just a, I know. I, I don't know. like it. I don't like it. Well, I will be here recapping it tomorrow night. I believe we'll have Hawkeye great Kashina Alexander on the stream as well. That'll Stay be tuned. a fun night. Yeah, it will be a fun night regardless. And uh, assuming Caitlin Clark plays, which there's no indication to uh, suggest otherwise, she will break the record and it will be a special, special. Why wouldn't she play? I don't know. Is she is there is. What if she rolls her ankle in warm ups? Like, there's oh, always a possibility she doesn't play. I'm just saying. Okay. That's I all. Knew, I thought you knew something that we didn't know. No, no, no. I'm going to make sure, make very That's clear. That's all through the wire. Corey says that King Clark's not playing tomorrow. Well, people have said over and over again, was she going to break the record Thursday? If she plays, she will. But if she doesn't, she's not going to. <laughs> I got you. So, yeah. She'll, she'll play. She'll break it in the first quarter. She'll break it in the first quarter. And it sounds like Molly Davis is back healthy. They need her. Because they need another ball handler, and Caitlin was wore out, to say the least, uh, on Sunday. So she needs eight to break the record, I believe. So um, I think you're right. She she may break that in the first first half of play or first quarter of play. All right, folks. Uh, Iowa, the men falling to Maryland 78-66. We'll be back tomorrow recapping the Hawkeye women following their battle against Michigan. Gary, appreciate the time as always, sir. It's always a pleasure doing business oh, with good. you. Go All right. For Coach Gary Close, I'm Corey Rada from the Hawkeye of the Storm. Have a great night. We'll talk to you tomorrow.